Maybe we'll start with meditation instead. I don't know how your morning has been going, but um, meditation is always a, a good thing to add. Well, almost always. Eh? <laughs> so we'll meditate for 30 minutes. We'll give the uh, fire tending a chance over here. Before we get started, living with heating with wood, wood fire in the wood stove is always a little, um, well, all of the things out here in the forest, it's, um, a very good way to be uh, in touch with impermanence <laughs> and also um, really understanding where the, the basic needs come from. Water comes out of a small creek that we think is fed by a spring. It's really excellent water, but it's not certain, you know, and uh, Meeting with wood, there's always some the log rolls into the doors of the fire of the stove and you have to push it back and there's always some messing around with it. So it's very interesting. Working with the uncertainties uh, at a very basic level. I used to live in a house where the thermostat was scheduled to go up and down according to the time of day and you know, what we might be doing. It's all automatic, you know, programmable. <laughs> Those days are over. <laughs> this is very interesting. So working with what's coming up at the moment, it's going to be a kind of uh, what we're going to talk about today. There'll be more to it than that. More about uh, how to deal with Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair to take the words out of the suttas. But first, let's meditate. So find a comfortable position. And of course, sitting with the spine straight or lying down with the spine straight, whatever posture you use. In a way that you can let the body relax. And when we're sitting without a support for your back, and the spine is straight, then there's a balance that helps us to be able to relax our muscles. And it's kind of like having a stack of coins. If they're set neatly on top of one another, the stack is firm. And the spine, Similarly, when we find that balance point, then we don't have to work hard to hold up the body. The belly can relax. The legs can relax. The shoulders and arms and the muscles of the face. Take a few deep breaths at the beginning. 
and let any tension flow out of the body as we exhale. And then we can check in on the mind, the heart. What's the felt sense today, this moment? Tired or contented, happy? sad, bored, whatever it is. Just noticing, noticing if there's any anxiety. And the Buddha talked about observing our mental states. He encouraged us to know what the mind is doing how it's disposed. Is it dealing with greed or is it free from greed? We might relate to it more if we call it desire or wanting something. Is the mind free from wanting anything? Or is there something it wants? Maybe we don't even know what it is. Sometimes we have that feeling of wanting something, but there's no object. Wanting something to be different, we don't really know what it is. But there are other times when the mind is free from wanting. It's content, it can just remain as it is. And then the Buddha asked us to check in on the mind to see if there's anything we do not want. Sometimes he says, is there any hatred in the mind? Or is the mind free from hatred? And we can look at the subtler forms of being free from wanting to get rid of anything. Or is there something uncomfortable, something irritating, something we'd like to get rid of. When the Buddha says these things, he doesn't say, okay, now, you know, get rid of it or change it. He doesn't talk about that at all. He just says, know, know what the mind is doing, know what state the mind is in. He doesn't say, oh, good, your mind is free from wanting, your mind is free from wanting to get rid of. It is good, but he doesn't, he doesn't go to that right away. He's like, just be with the way it is. And he says, is the mind, does the mind have delusion? Interesting question. Are we aware and clear enough to know whether we are, have delusion or not? Is the mind free from delusion?
How can you tell if your mind has delusion? There are some clues. Certainly if it has greed or hatred, it also has delusion. If it's obsessing about anything, there's delusion. But if the mind is contented, open and free, then if there's delusion, it might be quite minor. So knowing the state of the mind and regardless of whether we think it's a wholesome or an unwholesome state, we can be present with it. And we're already working with mindfulness because we're observing. We're there with it. We're not caught up in it in the same way as we might have been before asking ourselves these questions. And we can bring some kindness to these mental states, especially the ones that are so difficult, having hatred or ill will, anxiety or fear, depression, or longing, a wish for something, maybe feeling like we're not all right as we are. We can bring compassion and kindness to these mental states, a poor mind, suffering, We suffer over things being destroyed. We suffer over things being lost. Suffer over unkind words that have been said to us. All kinds of things that cause discomfort. Painful feeling. Or the mind might be happy, contented. It might be happy and concerned that the happiness will go away. So here we are with our mind. And once we see, take into account the state of the mind and then bring some kindness and some compassion, then we can invite the mind to become calm, set aside what's there if it's minor enough, if it's major if it's really filling the mind and we want to stay present with that feeling and notice how it represent gets represented in the body strong emotions strong mental states will show up in the body tightness somewhere 
perhaps pain. Heaviness. And if we think about the causes, the, the conditions bringing about these mental states, we can get pretty wrapped up in it sometimes, but we also have the option to just focus on the feeling. And let go of the story. There are a thousand stories. We take the, the broader view, we see how they repeat again and again and again. Maybe different players, different details, but it's the same thing. A pattern comes to an end when we either gain the insight for it to change or we put a practice in place. We develop our skills, our mind, and it changes the pattern of how we interpret, react, respond to the things that happen. That's how the change occurs. And we gradually become, as the Buddha said, unaffected. The mind can remain unaffected. Painful feeling, pleasant feeling. We do not enter the mind and remain. Instead, what remains is peace. The spiritual happiness that does not depend upon the conditions in the world. Now, when the time is right, we've dealt with strong feeling or hindrances to meditation, then we can invite that spiritual energy to expand and just rest in that awareness, enjoy, happiness, peace. We can observe the mind becoming more and more calm, more still and and then just watch what happens because it's like something else takes over. And the process of going deeper into meditation unfolds naturally. And from that unfolding, that observation then that's how we, we learn, we, uh, we feel, we experience, directly experience the path, the process, all the way to awakening.
welcome everyone. So I was asked if uh, I could talk about what to do when we're feeling sad, um, sad or um, feeling grief or maybe anxiety, um, depression, and what the Buddha said about this. So I, I know we've talked about these things from time to time in various ways, but I want to share a sutta with you that um, I'm hoping will provoke some questions and, and maybe some experiences that you've had. Okay, so this is called Situations. If that's the title that Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi gives it. And these are the kinds of situations where we might feel the things I've mentioned. Um, and he says there are five situations that we can't, none of us can obtain. Uh, any any uh, mendicant or ascetic, any Brahmin or Deva or Mara or Brahma or anyone in the world, that includes all of us, any human being, or um, as you can see, any kind of other living being advanced enough to um, kind of be aware of the situation, we still can't avoid certain things. And what are those things? It's when um, what is subject to grow old does not grow old. So as you well are well aware, none of us can change the fact that we're aging all the time. And if we live long enough, we will become old and we can't change that. No one can. Uh, this is a situation that no one can, can change. The second one is about illness that living beings are subject to becoming ill and we can't um, say I'm never gonna be ill. You know, we already heard about, you know, being exposed to COVID and wondering, oh, have I got it? I've been through that a few times myself in the last two years, and many of you may have also. And, you know, whether that's what's happening in our body or not, we can't, we can't stop that. We can take precautions, but we can't stop it once it's there. Uh, we can care for it. Anyhow, we'll get to like what to do, but these are situations that anyone in the world is subject to. And as well with death, as we know, the mind continues to sort of try to put it off and act like, well, it's so far in the future, I don't have to think about that. But actually, that can happen at any time. And if something is subject to death, there's no way we can say, well, I'm not going to die. Um, and then the Buddha also includes anything that might be destroyed. So any of our possessions even our relationships, you know, anything that might be destroyed, we can't say this is not gonna be destroyed. It's, we're subject to that destruction. And also with anything that could be lost. Uh, we've all lost things. Some of them are trivial. Some of them felt important, but if it can be lost, it may well be, lo be lost at some point. So then what is the Buddha What's his point? He says, if we are an uninstructed person, <laughs> Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi likes to use the word worldling. It kind of makes us smile a bit. <laughs> a little bit Tolkien. <laughs> a little bit Tolkien. <laughs> um, but the uninstructed worldling <laughs> is subject to growing old and grows old. Uh, and But when this happens, uh, they do not reflect that I'm not the only one for whom uh, that I'm subject to grow old and I grow old. They don't think about how beings come and go, pass away and undergo rebirth and that we're, we're all subject to growing old. So they don't think about, and this is kind of an interesting way of putting it. They don't think if I were to become sad, um, you know, weeping, lamenting, Become, and becoming confused about this, 
Um, I would lose my appetite and my features would become ugly. I would not be able to do my work. My enemies would be elated and my friends would be sad. Um, so they don't think like that. They just feel it. They, they, when they get old, they're upset. Um, they languish, it says, lament, weep, beating the breast, <laughs> becoming confused. This is called an uninstructed worldling pierced by the poisonous dart of sorrow who only torments himself. And then the Buddha goes on to talk about the same thing. We've got all these ellipses here. When we become ill, when we're dying, when something is destroyed or something is lost. And then of course the Buddha goes on to what happens when you're not an uninstructed worldling, but you're a noble disciple. So all of us who have heard the Dhamma or practicing, this is a way to practice, to work with those experiences. And it's exactly what he said that the uninstructed worldling doesn't do. When this happens, one of the ways to work with it and we just recently, I mean, we get a fair um, number of calls from people who are going through very challenging experiences, and it really helps to talk about the Dhamma, it helps to talk about how to handle the particular conditions that are arising. And this is one of the things we often talk about, it's kind of taking a bigger view. You know, when we have a great loss in our life, and when we when we are um, being subjected to depression, you know, that arises in the mind. I mean, sometimes that just comes on almost, almost the way a cold, a common cold or, or, a, or a bout with COVID would, you know, it just comes. Um, it has its causes and conditions, but it's not as though we can just decide we're not gonna get depressed. And when these things happen, to be able to step back and say, I'm not the only one who goes through this. For all beings that come and go, that pass away and undergo rebirth. So this is another way of thinking in the broader perspective. Uh, this is very helpful. Uh, even when we have a very traumatic loss and uh, lo quite a long time ago, um, a mother of a son who had killed himself came to me. She said he, he was really Buddhist. She, they wanted a Buddhist funeral, but they didn't know who to find to do that. So she asked if I would do that. And of course, it's not just about showing up on the day when the friends and family come. It's, it's about talking about this experience. And one of the things that it can seem, um, maybe seem, harsh in a way if it's if it's um presented i think in the in the wrong way but if we if we really take the time to be with the feelings but we also look at the longer view the fact that you know this young man came into this world from somewhere and going somewhere else um, that there is this coming and going passing away and being reborn and that this is something that none of us can stop. And when we think about that, when we recognize that there's more to the story than this single lifetime and the time we've had together and that there probably have been times together in the past and there may well be again in the future, but that's not really the, the point. The point is we develop the mind so that we can see all of this with kindness and compassion. We can see all of this with wisdom. And it, it really helps to bring a kind of peace in the midst of this, these strong feelings. So the, the tendency is, you know, here it's like, okay, if I, if I become sad, um, it's gonna be harder on me. Not that we can avoid sadness, but if I were to go deep into that and just become a wash in it, 
if I perpetuate that negative feeling, I'll lose my appetite. Um, you know, other people in my life will be affected. You know, what if I give that feeling, that experience, the time and care that it deserves that I, and it de deserves whatever it takes for us to be with it, especially if we feel it presenting in the body. If we, if we go to that physical feeling that gets presented, it's so much easier to work through it or to let it pass. So we, we know that we're subject to age, old age, to sickness, to death, to the destruction of things, to the ending of things, to loss. And then we don't torment ourselves. So we can ask ourselves, when do I torment myself with things? And how can I stop that? So the Buddha says, then the noble disciple doesn't have that sorrow. It doesn't have that, that, that dart or that extra suffering. And then they realize Nibbana. So I thought that was an interesting thing to just throw right in there. This is such an important <laughs> kind of step. Like what happens? This is such an important step of how we are with these things in life. That the wisdom of you know, the nature of sangsara really develops in the mind, really develops and our ability to be present with what happens and let it flow through, let it, let it hit, its, hit its crest or its deepest valleys um, without any clinging to it, let it, let it pass on through with wisdom, seeing it with wisdom. So again, for all beings that come and go, that pass away and undergo rebirth, what is subject to aging, sickness, death, destruction, or loss? Ages, gets sick, dies, gets destroyed, or is lost. And we, if we were to sorrow, languish, lament, weep, beating our breasts, becoming confused, then what is subject to those things? And that experience happens. We lose our appetite. Our features become ugly. What an interesting piece to put in there, right? And, would, and we would not be able to do our work and our enemies would be elated and our friends be sad. So the noble disciple is without sorrow, without the dart and realizes Nibbana. So after having said this, you know, laying this out, these five situations in life that none of us can avoid, then he gives this verse, which I find very helpful. It's not by sorrowing and lamenting that even the least good here can be gained. Not for ourselves or for the people who have passed away or for any condition that has changed. The, the continuing to sort of, if we, if we continue um, feed those feelings, we can't do any good through that. Knowing that one is sorrowful and sad, one's enemies become elated. When the wise person does not shake in adversities, knowing how to determine what is good, his enemies are saddened. Having seen that his former facial expression does not change. Have you ever seen that in anyone? There's some loss. They lose their job or they lose some of their livelihood or in some other way or something else happens to them and, and they just don't even change. They just, they just take it in stride. I know people from where I grew up, um, it, 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 you don't even have to be Buddhist. You just have to understand life. Basically, people know a lot of Dhamma. Dhamma is here for everyone to see. And they just take it in stride. 
whenever one might gain one's good, wherever one might gain one's good in whatever way, by chanting mantras, maxims, gifts, or tradition, there one should exert oneself in just that way. Now, this, this I believe, means that we do whatever we can do. So yeah, you get sick, you take medicine, you help people. Um, we, we try to uh, do what we can. But if one should understand this good cannot be obtained by me or anyone else. So, you know, we do what we do our best to bring the situation um, around, turn it around so that good things are happening. But what if that, you know, that is, or there always is this point where you can't do it. And then you say, you accept the situation with our, without sorrow, and you think the karma is really strong. What can I do now? Which I think is a really interesting question. It's like, okay, this old age, this sickness, this dying, this destruction, this loss, it's happening and I can't stop it. I can't turn it around. The karma is really strong, but I can do something, can help someone, I can see this from this perspective of Dhamma. I can share merit, you know, blessings with other people. I can be kind. Um, one of the stories Ajahn Sumedho has ta told a lot, <clears throat> I've heard him tell it many times, was about how when his father got old, he was so difficult to deal with. Um, he would be so angry that he, the people who cared for him would like leave the room crying. And this was, this was so hard. I mean, it's hard to lose your capacity. His father was a very powerful man in his life. And then as he, as he became old and, and incapacitated, he would be so angry. And Ajahn Zamato said he saw that and he realized he just made the determination, I'm never going to be like that. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be kind. You can always be kind. Even very deeply. But it takes that kind of practice, I think. You know, thinking about it ahead of time. You know, really reflecting on these truths so that when we are faced with these experiences, we go, yeah, now it's my turn to be sick. Now it's my turn to lose something important to me. And of course, all along the way, we can ask ourselves, how important is any of it? It's all impermanent. How important really? And what is the importance? What kind of importance was this thing or this condition, this set of conditions, maybe, maybe it was something really supportive that was really helpful, but how can I be free from the need for that? Because these are some reflections. And it's really, you know, we've talked many times together about taking care of what we feel and not suppressing. So I don't want anyone ever to get the idea that, oh, if I'm a good Buddhist, then I'm just going to like not have these feelings. And that just isn't how it works. And it doesn't help because then we suppress things and we put on a, a, a face, but that's not how we feel. And then whatever that energy is that's not been taken care of, they'll come out in funny ways later, probably or even cause illness in us if we, if we keep shoving it down. So that's not how the Buddha wanted us to take care of it. We have to refer back to the, to the noble truths. You know, whenever we experience dukkha in any of its forms, we turn towards it and understand it. And then we see the cause and 
then it then it subsides. So we want to be sure, you know, kind of kind of take these different aspects of the Buddha's teachings together, so that we can see the subtleties more and the options we have, the the different approaches we can take that are um, suitable to what we're experiencing in the time that um, it's happening. And always remember there's something you can do. What, what can I do now? All right, thank you. That's all I wanna say for the moment. Neil? <laughs> Um, could you possibly um, bring the screen up again? There was one phrase I did not understand. Yes, indeed. Where was it, Neil? You know? At the end. Okay. But if one should understand, this good cannot be obtained by me or anyone else. I just don't get what's being said there. What is this good? good if this good is referring back to the previous uh stanza yeah i think why would it why would it be not obtainable okay so the good meaning i can avoid or overcome the illness i can recover what was lost i can you know, the, that's the that's what that means. Oh. The good. If I can gain this back again, or I can maintain it. Oh, okay. You know, like you know, prayers and chanting, Davis help, <laughs> and they do help. Um, you know, it's not a a vain kind of thing, or or, you know, there are on a spiritual level, there are those kinds of approaches. On a material level, there might be other things. We go to the doctor, get the medicine, <laughs> you know, but if it doesn't turn around to be the situation, the outcome we would like, and we recognize that, then we say, well, I can't make this happen and, and neither could anyone else. You know, it's like, this is just the way it is. This is part of being a human being. Okay, I just think, yeah, that makes sense. I, I just think the use of the word good there was a little. Yeah. I mean, I would almost say, if one should understand this delusion cannot be obtained by me oh. or anyone else. I mean, that it wouldn't be delusion. Um, well, th this, I know what you mean, but. This, this um, desire this for word. this impossible desire cannot be obtained. I yeah. mean, is that is that what you're saying? That's kind of what it means? You could say it that way. Yeah, like a good, good fortune, good. like a good fortune in life, you know, it's it's like, I mean, even when we chant blessings, like when people make offerings, um, you know, the blessings are for avoiding disease and difficulties and you know, it's, it's definitely like there is always this worldly aspect because, you know, those things do help us be able to practice and develop. Yeah, like we had a perfect example of this yesterday. <laughs> or what day was that? Thursday. Like, so we went to Chipotle and they overcharged us. And so Paula was like trying to get them on the phone and like work it out with the Chipotle people. And so like there was this loss <laughs> of, of money from them overcharging us. And so she's trying to do what she can and she can't get through the tree phone. And she's like trying on her phone, all these different things. And she just got nowhere. And that's when you say, huh, the comma's too strong. What can I do? I did my best. And then you got to let go and not like sorrow over the loss of the eight dollars or whatever it was you know but it's things like that in life that we do get like worked up over for no good reason yeah don't do that and letting go of, <laughs> letting go of something small like that yeah. over and over and over again Makes really the bigger helps ones us easy, yeah. let go of the bigger ones there was a point early on in my practice where i realized you know if i'm going to be upset about this 
how am I going to handle death? How am I going to handle, <laughs> you know, someone close to me passing away? You know, I mean, I thought I got to get, I got to get with the program here and deal, you know, let go, let go, learn to let go. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Neil. Yes, Mamal. Thank you, Aya. Um, well, I love this sutta. Um, the fact that uh, the Buddha is not selling us like uh, really from death or or or, or sickness. Uh, it, it, he's telling us the truth, and and that's beautiful. Um, but uh, my question is: um, you you said that uh, we shouldn't repress. Uh, our feelings or, or, or our thoughts or anything like that. But at the same time, the, the Buddha, uh, well, probably the thoughts and that, that's where I'm going to, because at the same time, there's the right effort, right? And, and, and we, we should uh, abandon unwholesome thoughts. And, 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 and that's, that's my question. Uh, the balancing uh, act there about uh, uh, feelings, thoughts, differences between that. And in practice, it, it's a little bit complicated when once we, we get into that, right? Yes, yes, but that is the breaking point right there between feeling and thought. So thoughts we can control. The Buddha said we can train our mind to think what we wanna think when we wanna think it. That's that's like where, where we're headed. And when we have feeling, of course, there's always, often there's thought that comes along with it. So almost, almost the same moment, thought and feeling arise together because thought, thought can cause feeling to arise. And sometimes feeling arises and we don't have a, a thought object to attach it to, but we create one. You know, you can just wake up in the morning and feel miserable and then you blame something. <laughs> you know, <what> I'm <laughs> this has got to be somebody's fault. You know, <laughs> we can have whole breakdowns of, of relationships because of that kind of thinking. Um, and then people split up and they still feel the same way and they go, oops. <laughs> it wasn't the partner after all. <laughs> was the problem. Um, but, but that's right, that's right in the area to investigate. So sometimes feeling arises and we don't have to be with it and, and care for it and observe it so much because it's the same thing we've felt over and over again. We've already done a lot of that work. We know, oh yes, this is my karma, pa karmic pattern. This is, a, this is a pattern that just keeps repeating but I know what it is. So I can turn my attention to something else, something wholesome. With thought, we can turn our attention to something wholesome. Even the thoughts come because of patterns, of old patterns, you know, like maybe we have a tendency to be critical of other people or critical of ourselves. And that critical mind comes up, you know, just out of the old pattern. And then we notice it and we go, ah, uh, no. <laughs> we're going to look at the good qualities in this person. We're going to look about at whether or not what they're doing here really matters at all. If it does matter, maybe we can come to it with some compassion. But it's like at that point, we don't need to go, oh, poor, poor me, I'm feeling that again. You know, it's like, okay, we've already seen all the details about this particular thing. But when we have Okay, and, and okay, there are other examples. Let's say we see something that provokes intense lust. We definitely need to take care of that lust, but it's not in a way that you never coddle these feelings. You, we want to put that lust aside. So the Buddha's um, idea of, well, think about that from the perspective of the reality of that, that lust comes from a delusion. We think this is beautiful. We think this is sexy. We think this is whatever. But if we strip the skin off, we've got a different feeling. It's a different point of view. And we need to address it. And, you know, like this is like with the five hindrances, desire, aversion, sloth, torpor, restlessness, worry, doubt. We have ways to work with these things. So 
when a lot of fear arises, we can talk to ourselves, but we also stay present with the fear as it you know, presents itself in the body. A lot of things, fear and sadness, are very good examples of things to be present with that feeling that arises in the body so that we can understand what's behind it, understand, um, you know, like maybe this process started a long time ago and we can get some understanding of the root of this feeling. So I hope that's helpful. If there really is a variation as you, as you practice, how much, um, you know, attention to pay to these things. And the thing that happens if we're paying attention, if we suppress a feeling, it's actually turns out to be suppression rather than, you know, okay, I understand this and I put it away is, is how much it returns and the veracity with which it returns. So on a retreat, there was a, a young person who came to me and said that during a meditation, this incredibly intense feeling arose in their chest, all, like almost like they're going to have a heart attack or something. It's just so intense, the tightness, the pain in the chest. And I coached them about being present with that feeling, staying present with that feeling in the body without making any story about it, or if a story arises, you shelve the stories, the story, the situation, this is where we get wrapped up and we, and we develop more of this unwholesome feeling. But if we set the story aside, we just stay present with the feeling in the body, it will subside. I gave that person the, they said they, they, said they felt the heart was pounding so hard and their breathing became so labored, they were afraid of disturbing the other meditators. I told them they could practice on their own if they want to in their room, but to keep talking to me about what's happening. And, and what they reported was by being able to stay present with it, it calmed down. Later it came back, but it wasn't as strong and it calmed down. Later it came back again, but it was even less strong, calmed down. And, and then they didn't have it anymore. And that's ten, that tends to be the pattern. And, and what karmic thing they were working through, no one knows, and it doesn't matter. It's just a matter of being with it and understand, observing it, being present with it, not caught up in it, not freaking out about it. So that's kind of the idea. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's clearer now. And I think there's a lot of working with perceptions here, right? Uh, sometimes uh, feelings and thoughts come out of perceptions that we have about ourselves or, or others. So probably the keys in, in perception, right? Yeah, and those perceptions carry delusion. And that's what we have to re remember. You know, it's like, this is a big step away from where maybe you and I know I have been in the past before hearing the Buddha's teachings where I believed my perceptions. And that's dangerous. <laughs> Those perceptions are shaped by all these conditions and causes and it's not truth. Yeah, thank you, Mimo. Thank you. Lisa? Lisa? Okay, um, I have an issue I'm looking at a lot right now with uh, anxiety, and um, I'm actually feeling very anxious right now <laughs> when I was waiting to talk. And um, several things you said in answer to Memo's question really address that, I think. So I'm glad this is being recorded. I can listen again when I'm not feeling anxious. But <laughs> um, I was just thinking it's such an an interesting mix of um, of craving and and aversion um, because I I'm trying to control things and strategize and plan so that everything comes out just the way I want it and um, you know that's delusional also so <laughs> you know um, and also what you were saying about um, sometimes we just have long-standing habits of a certain way of feeling and then we 
create a, a thought or a story to go along with them. I think mm -hmm. I do that quite often. But anyway, I was wondering if you have anything else um, um, pertaining to uh, anxiety, what to do about it. It's very... Yeah, and, and if I may, I, I think maybe the anxiety is around moving. Yeah, because we've all had moving anxiety, I bet. <laughs> it's like, what a, what a chore that is. And there are, you know, just kind of taking this example, and then if that if anxiety arises for any of us that has other kinds of causes and conditions behind it, maybe can adapt this. But so, so there's this big task and it's got a lot of potential for, um, you know, like things to not be done, not be perfect. And, and it's very likely that things will not go the way we plan. So one thing we can do is just acknowledge to ourselves, okay, this is a very anxiety producing situation. It's one of those situations that, you know, it's like, it's okay that this anxiety is arising, but then we don't have to like, you know, build on it. We can see if we can um, incorporate some times where you can just stop and do some breathing you know, like even when you're in the middle of it, and you notice that you're feeling anxious and just like take some time to just really let yourself be in your body and feel what you're feeling. And you don't have to like stay there until the anxiety goes away the way I would with certain other kinds of experiences, because it's just kind of like it's going to it's, it's just going to rev up again and again in the process, possibly. But to to just give you know, think about what you can do with your mind and with your, and with your, um, and with your body that would help kind of like relieve it, kind of like release some of that. Maybe you can do a little bit of exercise or something, even though, you know, and then another thing that helps <clears throat> is to, I'm not real good at this yet, but sometimes I can do it. When things go wrong, laugh. It's, it's embedded in the Thai culture, you know, like the story of, you know, being, being with a bunch of people on the back of a truck, because that's what, the way you get hauled around a lot. You're in the back of a truck. You have these trucks <clears throat> with the benches on both sides, and there's a, a, a frame over the top with a canvas or something like that, and you're going along and and the truck hits a big bump and somebody hits their head on the frame and they just laugh. And this is the, this is the response. So, you know, like we can change our response and it releases what's happening in the body. And, you know, just like, oh yeah, this is the way this process is. It's going to have all these uncertainties and these, um, you know, the ball gets dropped and people don't show up on time who are going to help. And, you know, like all kinds of things are likely to go wrong. And you can like tell yourself that ahead of time, you know, this is going to be a process where things are likely to go wrong and nothing's really going to be that bad. Probably. So what? Another good line is, who cares? What? what was that again? Who cares? Oh, who cares? So what? Who cares? Do we have any more? Um, there's one I used to use. I can't remember now. Nothing wrong. Nothing wrong. <laughs> do you want to say that? You say it better than I do. Nothing hey. wrong. <laughs> That, that kind of a funny voice too. Yeah, 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 it, yeah. Helps. <laughs> it, it helps. It helps. Like that's it. life. That's life. That's good I like life. the oh. idea about uh, laughter 
because it's such a visceral kind of um, shaking off the, I think it's, it could be helpful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remembered what I used to say. Oh, well. <laughs> oh, well. You know, and and it's it's like just really like taking in the sutta, you know, it's like this, this is sangsara. <laughs> you know, that story, I, I think I've told you about Venerable Tipton Chodron when she was spending the 12 years in the cave. Um, and she she's practicing in the cave, but the, this woman would come and and I think bring her food and things. And the woman needed to go get stuff, but she needed to leave her baby with venerable. Uh, not to children. Tens and Palmo. Tens and Palmo, I'm sorry. Got the wrong, wonderful, uh, very accomplished woman in mind. <laughs> Tibetan nun. <laughs> Tibetan nun. Yeah, one of those Tibetan nuns. <laughs> venerable Tens and Palmo. So she tells this story how this lady left her baby with her and she's, the baby is crying and crying and crying and crying. And she does everything possible to, to give this baby comfort and it's just crying. And finally, she's holding the baby in her arms and she looks down at the baby and she said, look, this is Sangsara. And the baby looked up at her and just stopped. So sometimes we can do that to our mind. This is this is samsara. This is what you get. This is what it is. This is suffering. It's okay. <clears throat> Karen. Um, you had a question about I with the Suda, it seems to be saying, and I, I have heard this before, is that you know, Arahants and the Buddha, they still had feelings. So, um, so for them, I'm just wondering the experience of what that would be like, a feeling would arise, like say fear, and they would just notice it, fear. So it sounds like equanimity has more to do with our reactivity than actual feelings. Like sometimes, you know, when you're talking about equanimity, there's often this feeling that people just dull out or numb out, but that doesn't sound like the case. It sounds like more like the react reactivity is gone, but the feelings are still there. And you can now be equanimous towards those feelings and not, so if fear rose, I wouldn't be going into, uh, oh, that's fear of death. And then start going into all these stories about how I'm fearful of death. They would just kind of notice it and I've got that equanimity now I can just go yeah that's fear of death is that kind of a correct understanding I think so so that there are a couple of things like when the Buddha said you know one of the miracles of the Tathagata is that you know that a feeling's just a feeling and a thought is just a thought and a perception is just a perception he actually includes all three of those and and they talk about the arahant like a feeling just just rolls off. It's like a, a spark coming out of the fire and landing on the ground and just going out. Or it's like the drip of water on the lotus leaf and it just rolls off. It's like, those, I like the spark out of the fire because, you know, we've seen that, you know, so many times and you just see how it goes out immediately. So it's like, or the Buddha uses this phrase that it, that, that does not enter the mind and remain. So the mind remains equanimous. The mind remains unaffected. So where are you feeling this feeling? You're feeling it in the body. Yeah. The body is reacting with fear. The body is, is reacting. And the body will often react in, in various ways when we're dying. And to not take that as this is now means that I don't have, um, that my mind is not okay. Like I, I, if you read Stillness Flowing and you read the, that's a, a, the, biography of Ajahn Chah, and you read about the last stages of his life when he was ill, there were times apparently, I didn't know this before reading it, but there were times apparently when he would be really get apparently angry. And like it, uh, his disease affected his mind. And there would be these, he would say things that were troubling, you know, like harsh or, or maybe coarse. And then in a more lucid time, he would say, don't pay any attention to that. That's just the disease. 
And, and this idea that while we're in our body, that the mind is operating through the brain and the brain can have, you know, all kinds of um, physical problems, whether it's uh, dementia or Alzheimer's or whatever, you can have problems based on the, the state of the body, based on the state of the brain, but that's not the mind. And when at the, just before death or in that process, the mind re starts to separate from the body and then the mind is not affected. So the Arahant has that realization of the way things actually are and they're not going to take the fears and the whatever else arises through the body seriously because they know better. That's a deep knowing that never changes. Mm -hmm. And so it's exactly like what you're saying. It's like they, they recognize that there's that feeling, but it's just a feeling. I had an interesting experience a few months ago where kind of fear of death rose up. And um, it was weird. All of a sudden my brain just said, why are you fearful of losing this body? You've had like millions of them. If you don't get enlightened, you're going to have millions more. <laughs> <laughs> it just kind of like the fear just went away. I wasn't concerned yeah. for a few moments. I just wasn't concerned about this body because I just had this realization that, you know, you've been cycling through this, you know, this body's going, next one's coming. And <sighs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Wisdom takes care of the problem. This is, this is what Ajahn Ganha says often. Wisdom solves the problem. Wisdom takes care of the problem. And just as an aside, when I was in Thailand, a great saying that I heard that I loved when I was getting a little fussy and anal about something I ordered, and the Thai people said to me, same, same, but different. <laughs> and I, I, I myself, if I'm getting anal about something, I'm like, same, same, but different, Karen. That's good. That's good. That could be helpful for That's moving. <laughs> same, same, but different. Yeah. Hey, since we're going for asides, I like when they translate that um, as invade the mind and remain. Oh, yes. Because it is. Did I say pervade? You said enter the mind and oh, remain. Invade. Same, yeah. same, but different, you know? And <laughs> like, I like the invade thing because it is like, it's an invasion of your, you know, peace <laughs> in there. And you don't kind of invite the invader in, you kind of kick him out, you know? So yeah, anyway, aside. <laughs> Karen, did you want to say anything more? No, I just forgot to lower my hand, sorry. No problem. <laughs> well, everyone, it's great to see you today and um, take good care of yourselves. And I hope to see you again soon.